Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. Welcome back to another episode of Wild Wisconsin Off the Record. I'm your host, DNR's Digital Media Coordinator, Katie Grant. This year marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. That's 50 years of living, changing, and advancing. In 1970, a gallon of gas was 36 cents. The Beatles released Let It Be and then later broke up, and a quarter would get you a dozen eggs. It was also the year of the very first Earth Day, founded by former Wisconsin Governor Gaylord Nelson. It was a time when factories pumped pollutants into the air, lakes, and rivers with few repercussions. Gas guzzling cars ruled the roads. Before 1970, there was no EPA, no Clean Air Act, and no Clean Water Act. Then a senator, Gaylord Nelson, had an idea to raise awareness about air and water pollution. His idea took off, and on the first Earth Day in 1970, millions of Americans participated in rallies, marches, and teach-ins for environmental education across the country. Earth Day catalyzed a movement in the United States that founded the Environmental Protection Agency and ignited a spirit of stewardship that has driven progress for five decades. Today, Earth Day is celebrated around the world with billions of people participating in their own way. Although Gaylord Nelson passed away in 2005, his legacy lives on through his daughter Tia, who was 14 at the time of the first Earth Day. She has since followed in her father's environmental protection footsteps. Today, Tia Nelson is the Managing Director on Climate for the Outrider Foundation. She is internationally recognized as a champion for environmental stewardship and climate change. Before the Safer at Home order, we spoke with Tia in early March to hear more about her father's life work, what Earth Day means to her, and how you can get involved. Just because most of us are at home doesn't mean you can't celebrate Earth Day this year. As we all do what we can to slow the spread of COVID-19, the DNR encourages you to celebrate 50 years of Earth Day close to home. Be sure to practice social distancing if you're out in the community. At the Wisconsin DNR, we embrace Earth Day 365. For us, every day is Earth Day. Sit back and listen in to how a Wisconsin senator helped establish Earth Day 50 years ago and how his daughter keeps his memory alive today. My name is Tia Nelson. I am Managing Director uh, for the Climate Change Program at the Outrider Foundation. We seek to educate, engage, and inspire action on big global challenges uh, like climate change, help people understand the risks, but importantly, also help them understand the opportunities to be a part of the solution. Fantastic. So you could be doing anything in the world. Why are you so passionate about the environment? I have always had a love of nature. I spent a lot of time in the outdoors as a child. I went on to study wildlife ecology at the University of Wisconsin. I had wanted to be a veterinarian, but I'm pretty severely dyslexic. And so I struggled in school. And once I found out that veterinarians had to go to school as long as doctors did. I figured that wasn't um, the best path for me. And I had the real privilege to study under uh, Joe Hickey, uh, who had done really important early work on how DDT was thinning uh, eggshells and impairing uh, the reproduction of bird species, uh, especially uh, predators um, in Wisconsin and across the country. It was a big inspiration to my father, who then went on to introduce the first bill to ban uh, the use of DDT. So I was uh, influenced um, by uh, great uh, professors like Joe Hickey, uh, Orrin Ronsted, uh, Bob McCabe. Um, Bob was dean of the Wildlife Ecology School when I uh, started attending the university, and he actually inscribed uh, and gave to my father the first day that my father was sworn in as governor uh, a inscribed first edition copy of uh, the Sand County Almanac with a beautiful inscription in it. I have it here on my desk. I'm saying, um, with and in between the lines of this book, you shall find great wisdom. Um, so I guess that's a long way of saying that uh, nature was imbued in me as a child, just as it was for my father. And I 
just seemed to gravitate to the issue naturally and studied it in school and went on to work in the capital. I worked for the DNR as a fisheries technician summer times while I was in college. It was a great job. Um, it's always been my life's work and, and, and my passion. Yeah. Did you ever feel pressure to work in the environmental space or you just knew it was what you wanted to do? I, I just did it. It yeah. just was me. It was just a part of me and uh, a keen interest of mine from a very young age. Uh, I must have obviously been influenced by my father and his work, um, but I don't remember an epiphany moment. Um, it simply was imbued in me from a very early age, and it wasn't something that I honestly gave a lot of thought to. It was just who I was. Tell us a little bit about your father's legacy. For anyone who doesn't know, why is he so important to Wisconsin and Earth Day in general? Well, my father grew up in a small town uh, called Clear Lake in Polk County in northwestern Wisconsin, not far from the St. Croix River where he camped and fished and canoed. And his experiences in nature as a child had a big influence on him. The places his father took him, uh, the St. Croix, uh, which I just mentioned, uh, also they visited the Apostle Islands. Uh, it's interesting for me to reflect on the fact that those childhood experiences in nature here in these magnificent uh, natural landscapes in Wisconsin became inspiration for him once he was elected to office. And he served in the state senate for 10 years. He became governor when I was two. In 1958, he was elected. And he became known pretty uh, quickly as, uh, across the country as the conservation governor, principally because of a bold initiative that he put forward to tax, uh, put a penny a pack tax on cigarettes to fund the Outdoor Recreation Action Program, known by the acronym ORAP, uh, to fund uh, the protection uh, of public recreation lands for the citizens of Wisconsin and to create opportunities for uh, fishing and uh, hunting and recreating. And that program was wildly popular and uh, drew a lot of national attention. The National Boating Magazine um, in, I think, uh, around 1960, um, their front page was All Eyes on Wisconsin with a picture of the state of Wisconsin and my, an image of my father overlaid and a story about the, the great uh, conservation innovation that was taking place in Wisconsin. So that was my father's... Um, uh, early efforts as governor, he took that experience and the popularity of that program, which is now known as the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund, named after my father and Republican Governor Warren Knowles, who succeeded my father when my father was elected to the Senate. Um, uh, so Wisconsin's had a long bipartisan tradition of support for uh, those types of initiatives. The ORAP program was wildly popular um, to members of both parties. My father went off to Washington as a United States Senator. Uh, he took with him a scrapbook of all the good press that he'd gotten for uh, pushing uh, conservation and outdoor recreation uh, agenda as governor in Wisconsin. And uh, he managed using uh, that uh, good press that he'd received here in Wisconsin to convince President uh, John F. Kennedy to do a conservation tour. My father was looking for a way to uh, get politicians to wake up to the fact that the uh, citizens uh, were eager and interested in uh, passing laws that protected our rights to breathe clean air and drink clean water and uh, protect uh, outdoor recreation areas. The conservation tour failed to accomplish what my father had hoped. Um, indeed, it was cut short after a few stops, as I recall. Um, and um, sadly, President Kennedy was assassinated several months uh, after that conservation tour. And it was between 1963 and 1969, my father continuing to push and talk about 
the environmental challenges of our time and to try to think of an idea that might galvanize um, uh, the people and uh, shake, as my father said, shake the political establishment out of their lethargy um, and uh, step up to address the big environmental challenges of our time. Keep in mind that Lake Erie was so polluted at the time um, that it had burned for days. Um, and uh, today you can uh, fish some good walleye out of there. Right, right. Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old uh, Swedish environmental activist, has gained international recognition for her climate strikes. She's also known for having said, adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to act as if the house is on fire because it is. How does it make you feel to see her and other young activists who are leading the environmentalist fight and do you think they fit with your father's legacy? Yes, they certainly do. It's a really the story of Greta Thunberg is um, a really inspiring one, and it is one that I reflect on quite often for the following reason: it would have been impossible for Greta to imagine when she was sitting alone protesting in front of the Swedish Parliament that that simple act of defiance would launch a global youth movement. Just as Rosa Parks could not have known that that simple act of defiance, saying no to that bus driver when he demanded she move to the back of the bus, she simply quietly said one word, no. It changed the course of history. Just as my father could never have known that the simple idea of setting aside a day to teach on the environment on April 22nd, 1970, would launch the environmental movement, propel the environmental movement forward in these unimaginable ways. Keep in mind, there was no environmental protection agency. Uh, it, uh, it was signed into law by a Republican president, Richard Nixon, um, some months after the first Earth Day. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, Endangered Species Act, a uh, whole slew of laws that we take for granted today passed that first decade after Earth Day. More environmental laws were passed um, in the decade that followed that first Earth Day than any other time in American history. And so Greta's story is inspiring to me in the way that Rosa Parks' story is inspiring in the way that my father's story is inspiring. These were individuals who had a set of values and cared passionately about something and they took action and they kept at it and they changed the course of history. It demonstrates to me the power of individual action to inspire others to become involved and be a part of the solution. And that, to me, is, is, is incredibly inspiring. Earth Day was successful beyond my father's wildest dreams. He never could have imagined that 20 million people would gather on that day or that 50 years later we would be celebrating uh, his legacy in this way. Right. And I, and, and I, I think that, that people on the 100th anniversary of Earth Day uh, we'll be saying the same thing about uh, uh, Greta Thunberg and the youth activists around the world who have done exactly what my father had hoped youth would do and youth did do that first Earth Day. It shook up the establishment and made them pay attention. Right, right. You've mentioned in past interviews that you have a kind of fuzzy memory when it comes to what you were doing on that first Earth Day. <laughs> As you got older, though, do you recall any of your father's continuing work with regard to Earth Day? Um, yes. Well, I, I was f almost 14 when the first Earth Day occurred, and I did not remember what I was doing. I, of course, get asked this question quite often. I you know, was tempted to make up a good story, but <laughs> I thought better of it. Uh, the way I learned that I was cleaning up trash at my junior high school is I was doing a talk show, a radio talk show, and one of my uh, um, friends from junior high called and said, you were with me, we were picking up <laughs> trash. So, um, but as the years um, ensued, uh, I think it really dawned on me the significance of Earth Day on the 20th anniversary 
I was on the Washington Mall with my father for the 20th anniversary. Uh, that was a magnificently large um, and significant anniversary event, and it was pretty obvious that this would be a, a big and enduring um, uh, thing for a long time uh, to come. My father worked tirelessly and he also, he, he felt very uh, drawn and very duty bound to speak to youth and he accepted the smallest school. If the kids wrote him a letter and asked him to come speak to them about the issues of the environment, he went. Um, he saw great promise in uh, our youth he knew that uh, it w were that it was the young people in 1970 that uh, uh, made such a big difference uh, in in the success of that event, and so he would give speeches uh, to big audiences. He would give talks to little schools. Uh, he was tireless in his advocacy, outreach, and. Um, uh, public efforts to engage people because he saw the power uh, of um, doing that. And so um, he was uh, tireless and in, in delivering that message and traveling around, giving talks, visiting schools, giving media interviews, and doing everything he could to continue to advance the cause. When you spoke with us uh, for our article in the Wisconsin Natural Resources Magazine, you said one of the reasons the first Earth Day was so successful was because of the way it grew organically at the local level rather than being planned from the top down. Why do you think this simplistic approach worked and has kind of made it work for the last 50 years? If you look at the first Earth Day, there were literally thousands of organizers in um, communities across the country. My father did not prescribe a specific agenda. He didn't tell them what issues they should be talking about. He encouraged people to think about what they cared about, where they lived, what the challenges, the environmental challenges, the quality of life challenges were wherever they lived, uh, whether it was in uh, the city or the countryside. Um, and people responded, I think, if you look at Adam Rome's book, he interviewed over 140 people, um, dozens and dozens and dozens of these local organizers. And one thing that's obvious is by not prescribing what the agenda was and what the issues were and how my father uh, trying to prescribe from Washington what people were supposed to do, but rather letting them identify their priorities and values um, uh, where, where they lived um, and worked uh, and raised their families. Um, that was very powerful. So some people planted trees, some people picked up trash, some people protested, some people had concerts. I have images of the uh, Earth Day uh, on State Street. State Street was closed and uh, an entomologist and in you know a professor of uh, insects uh, set up a booth or rather um, shabby looking one at that uh, <laughs> with information about the importance of insects as uh, pollinators. Um, my point is uh, whether it was a entomologist educating people on the importance of bees as a pollinator uh, or a, a Girl Scout troop picking up trash in, in their local neighborhood or another group um, planting trees, um, people felt empowered to take action in a way that uh, w was meaningful to them. And in, in not trying to control what people did and how they did it and how they messaged around it, um, it turned out to be really a, a, a stroke of genius on my father's part. For sure, for sure. So over the years, I'm sure you have participated in Earth Day in a lot of different ways. Uh, do you have any particularly memorable ways that you have celebrated it? Uh, well, they're all meaningful to me. It's... Um, always been important for me to honor my father and my own uh, life's work on Earth Day. It's particularly been important to me to uh, tell his story to kids 
um, so that they understand that my father was just a little boy from a little town um, in Wisconsin, and he grew up to change the world in unimaginable ways. And I want kids to know they have that power too. Um, so I have always done as much as I can, uh, uh, some uh, local events, media events, um, uh, try to talk to uh, school kids. Uh, this year is different though. This year I have a spreadsheet with, gosh, close to 40 um, appearances, interviews, podcasts like the one we're doing now. Um, uh, I'm very proud, very excited that we'll be debuting a uh, uh, film uh, at EarthX, the largest environmental film fest in the United States in Dallas, Texas. On, Earth, on the eve of Earth Day, we'll be opening that uh, EarthX event. Uh, we will be closing out the Smithsonian's Earth Optimism event on April 25th, uh, the day the mall, uh, Earth Day Mall event will occur. We've been invited uh, to show at Tribeca Film Fest uh, in New York and are still trying to figure out whether we can do all of these things in, in the sh short time frame of a week. Uh, we, I will be showing the film at the University of Wisconsin, Nelson, Nelson Institute of Environmental Studies, on Monday, April 20th. Uh, and what's exciting to me about the film is I recruited the youth activist Varshini Prakash, co-founder of the Sunrise Movement, and Bob English, the former Republican congressman, founder of a group called Republic EN. Uh, the two of them have joined me uh, in this film to honor my father and in a call to action uh, to people today to come together and address the biggest environmental challenge uh, of our time, which is climate change. And that uh, Bob and Varshini uh, uh, are joining me in talking about the need for a multi-generational, bipartisan, socially just movement to address climate change is just a source of enormous excitement and pride for me. So I'll be showing that film around the country. Uh, I will be doing more podcasts, more media interviews. Um, I'll be keynoting uh, after Earth Day at the annual meeting of the United Church of Christ. Uh, at the Midwest Renewable Energy uh, Fair up in Custer, Wisconsin. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be tired by the time it's all done, but it's, uh, um, it's a good challenge to have, and I just I couldn't be more grateful or excited to have the opportunity to tell my father's story and the story of other activists today um, and to encourage people to get involved and um, be a part of uh, building a brighter future. At what point did you and your family really start getting the sense that Earth Day had become something special? And did you guys ever discuss how big of a deal it had become? Um, well, sure, I talk to my brothers about it uh, on a regular uh, basis. I'm updating them on the stuff I'm involved in uh, here. But uh, as I mentioned a little earlier in our interview, I think it probably first dawned on me what a big deal it was on uh, f probably the 10th or the 20th anniversary, um, that it was clearly going to be an enduring um, event uh, and a part of an important part of my father's legacy. Um, and the families talked about it, um, you know, we talk about it all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but especially, you know, this time of year. What are a few ways Wisconsinites and beyond Wisconsin can embrace your father's legacy and celebrate Earth Day this year? Well, there's an unlimited number of things one can get involved in uh, or be a part of uh, you in, in your local community um, or uh, through uh, established organizations. And that was one of the things that was really exciting to me about the video we've produced. The, uh, the Sunrise Movement is very oriented towards youth activists. Uh, Republic EN is oriented towards a more conservative audience. What they share in common is prioritizing addressing the issue of climate change and um, uh, the future of our environment. There's really literally in an organization for anyone and everyone to join. Uh, and there's 
uh, uh, website, uh, the Earth Day Network has a site where you can go plug in your zip code and uh, it'll show you uh, local events. Uh, here in Madison, I invite everyone to attend the U University of Wisconsin, Nelson Institute of Environmental Studies, Earth Day um, celebration, which goes on, it is really going to be fabulous this year and uh, has a number of uh, significant national speakers uh, and workshops. And that's on April 20th, all day at Monona Terrace. Uh, there are um, uh, more local activities one could get involved in. Uh, and if you don't feel like joining a group, you can uh, do something with your neighbors or friends um, uh, that uh, would be probably pretty similar to what people were doing in 1970, deciding you know how, how they wanted to get involved, whether they wanted to go pick up trash or plant trees or join an organization. And uh, it's sort of un, un, unlimited in terms of, of what one can do because every, every individual action matters and, and people um, uh, have an opportunity to get involved in any number of ways. Yeah. So at Wisconsin DNR, we are embracing Earth Day 365 and encouraging residents to take small steps all year so that taking care of our natural resources isn't just a thing that we think about once a year. Do you have any suggestions for small steps that people can take to make a difference? There's a number of, of powerful small steps one can take, from reducing food waste to avoiding single-use plastic to uh, composting food scraps to using energy-efficient appliances to things like funny little fact to know and tell is that something called phantom power, meaning our devices plugged into the wall when we're not using them, uh, probably about 15% of uh, average home owner's electricity consumption. Simply unplugging those appliances uh, when you're not using them uh, is a way to save energy and it saves money. Um, so um, being a conscious consumer, uh, being aware of one's impact, uh, on the planet, knowing that, you know, I, one of my favorite quotes from my father is, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, not the other way around. And so um, we have to recognize that our natural resource base is finite um, and that we have to uh, be good stewards of it and that individual action, how we conduct ourselves in our daily life, r really does matter. Um, voting for um, uh, elected officials, whether at the local or state level, who put forward policies that protect our rights to breathe clean air and drink clean water is really important. Outrider.org has a section um, about how you can help. Uh, it includes uh, a way to assess uh, your personal greenhouse gas footprint and uh, things you can do to um, reduce it. So um, get involved, talk about it, take action, and uh, join an organization that suits your particular interests. At a time when there can be a lot of doom and gloom in the news, how do you stay optimistic about the future of our environment? I often say I'm in a complicated dance between hope and despair. You can't be involved every day of your life in the environmental challenges that we face today and not be concerned. Uh, the science tells us we have a lot to be worried about. On the other hand, I know uh, the power of individuals to make a difference. I know how on that first Earth Day, a simple call to action uh, precipitated significant progress in how we manage our resources and uh, protect our environment. And so, I reflect on my father's legacy and work. I reflect on the fact that he worked tirelessly and was felt a sense of defeat um, many, many times. But he got up the next day and went back to work and made significant progress. And I believe in American ingenuity. I know that we have a bright future of clean and renewable energy, that today renewable energy is cost less than fossil fuel energy. 
We have some big challenges as we make that transition, but we know what the solutions are. And uh, it's a question of creating the uh, social will and political capital to move forward uh, swiftly with a sense of urgency to address these challenges. And I believe we can do it, but we, we have to join together. That's why I'm so excited about the film with uh, Bob English and Varshini Prakash. They have very, very different ideas about what the solution is. That doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that they've come to the table to have a conversation about how we can work together and solve these big environmental challenges. That's what matters. And as long as we're having the conversation and agreeing that the problem requires an urgent response, we'll find a way to build the social capital and the political will to act. And so that is how I uh, uh, think about it and motivate myself uh, to carry on the work. You've been listening to Wild Wisconsin, a podcast brought to you by the Wisconsin DNR. Show us on social media how you're celebrating Earth Day this year by using hashtag Earth Day at home and tagging Wisconsin DNR in your posts. For more great content, be sure to subscribe to Wild Wisconsin wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review or tell us who you'd like to hear from on a future episode. Thanks for listening.